Welcome back to another episode of Black America's Health. I'm Dr. Tai, and we are continuing our conversation today around how to cope with everything that's going on right now. But this time, we're talking about our children. So when is the raw truth of the world just too much for our kids? You know, how do we know what's normal brattiness or if they're really having a tough time coping with something, either something we know about or don't know about? If you want to figure it out, stay tuned. And welcome back, Dr. Frank Clark and Dr. Tiffany Bell, both psychiatrists. Dr. Clark works with adults and Dr. Bell works with, works with children, teens, and patients with weight concerns. So today we're in your wheelhouse, Dr. Bell, so we're going to jump right in, all right? Okay. So children, especially right now, you know, with this novel coronavirus pandemic, are inundated with bad news, whether it's on the news, whether they're hearing stuff, you know, circling around them. So how do you know if your child is struggling? Thank you for the great question. Um, obviously, as parents, we all care about our children a lot, and we tend to know their typical behaviors. So the way I would say that you can tell if your child is struggling is if they have a behavior that is out of character for them. Um, kids, especially depending on the age groups, right? So preschoolers, um, younger children, they tend to get more clingy. Um, they want to be right next to you. They are crying more frequently, maybe more whining. Um, if you have toddlers, they tend to be defiant and maybe not listen anyway, but maybe that's happening more frequently. Um, they may have crying spells. And, and something people don't expect is potty trained children sometimes go backwards and will start having more accidents. Um, wetting the bed at night or during the day, uh, especially when they're very stressed. So when you have the older, older children like teenagers, um, I mean, they just may be irritable, be in their room, um, not want to talk on their phone, kind of room always dark, maybe just a change in behavior. Anything like that, I'd start getting concerned. Got it. And, you know, Dr. Clark, what about those those folks, parents, maybe they're not even the parents, their aunts, uncles, older cousins, that say, you know, I want to keep it real with my kids, you know, particularly in, in the Black community. Um, there's a lot of things that, that we have to tell our children to prepare them for life, right? I mean, all parents do, but in particular related to racism or, you know, violence, things like that. Um, what do you think about that? Like, what do you think about kind of showing kids too much too soon? Well, Dr. Ty, that's a great question. I, um, as you were uh, asking me the question, uh, the David Chappelle uh, episode popped in my mind of when keeping it real goes wrong. <laughs> and so uh, I, I would liken that to um, when we're talking to our kids about uh, grief or trauma, or, you know, we're talking about this pandemic and how it's impacted families. Well, so I think there it has, I'm a firm believer of it's not what you say, but how you say it. And so while we don't want to sugarcoat things for our children, I think we have to also think about um, the stage of life that they're in. You know, I, for example, I have a, you know, as we alluded to earlier, I have a 16 month old daughter. I'm, she doesn't know anything about COVID. And, you know, by the time she's grown, um, she probably won't even remember it. You know, this would be something that I'll be telling, you know, my wife and I, I'll be telling her, um, years down the road, you know, compared to someone who is in elementary school, you might talk about, um, this is what happens. Sometimes when, when bad things happen, this is how people may respond to them. They may have a stomach ache. They may have headaches. They, they may feel this way. I think it's important to normalize things for, for our children. Um, and we can still be honest. It's not that we, we have to lie to our children, but the last thing you want to say is, okay, um, this is what happened today on the news, and now you should be afraid of your life. Mm -hmm. That's going to kind of send a, a, a message to, I think, our children of, well, do I have to walk out every outside every day in fear? We don't want anybody to live in fear. Now, we know as adults that we even have to be mindful of that, right? Again, we kind of get into this catastrophic thinking or kind of this all or none, black or white thinking, and usually there's a gray area there. So I think when we're particularly talking about as it relates to the pandemic and, and people dying and things like that, I think kids are curious 
And so we want to honor that curiosity and, and inquiry, but we also want to be mindful of how we are approaching them um, so that one, they feel open um, to talking about it. And I think if we can have an honest dialogue that is, um, that necessarily doesn't beat around the bush, but also takes into account what they can comprehend um, you know, talking to a 16 year old is different than talking to a five year old. We're not going to say the same things. Uh, we're just, or we're going to say something, but we're going to say it in a different manner, right? It's like when you, when you teach math, um, I hated algebra, for example. So how you teach algebra to someone in high school is different how you would teach it to a, a fifth grader. So I think it's important to uh, basically keep it real, but keep it real with the caveats of knowing who your audience is, 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 is um, best described. Better. Absolutely. Sorry, go ahead, Dr. Bell. Sorry. Um, I wanted to say that I agree with you, Dr. Clark, that um, it is very important that you do it on an age appropriate level. That's very important. And we have to remember that our children are forming their view of the world, right? We know the world is scary, can be scary. Um, we know that there are bad things happening, but not only bad things happen. And I think our children just, they take us at, at their word. You know, if we say, watch out, if you go outside, this might happen, you might get this, be careful, run, you know, then they don't get to know that, oh, some, some days are good. You know, two years ago, this wasn't a problem. 10 years from now, this might not be a problem. To a three-year-old, this is their entire world. And if mama is scared, if, if their dad is afraid, then they are gonna hold that fear and it becomes, um, and you probably know this Dr. Clark is an uh, adult psychiatrist, that when they're 25 years old and they're just randomly afraid to walk in public spaces, you know, they may have to go to therapy one day and say, oh, you know, I forgot when I was two, you know, there was a pandemic. So it's just important that we, we remember that our children are forming their worldview. Everything they see is kind of depending on how we, how we show it. And so as best as we can, we don't wanna lie, but we do wanna just keep it in balance and, and not scare them, even if we're afraid, we have to check our own anxiety. No, it's true. And it's, it's, it's tough because for parents who are not in healthcare, right, they may not actually know what's completely appropriate or not, right? So I think that what you listed is a, is a good start because you know, they may say, you know, they may be thinking about it in, in their way of comprehending it. So, well, I would want to know about that so I could stay safe. I would want to know to walk on that side of the street and not this side of the street mm -hmm. if, if it were me. But to your point, they don't realize that it's being processed differently by a younger brain. And again, a five-year-old versus a 10-year-old versus a 16-year-old mm -hmm. is going to process it differently. Um, you know, I very often, you know, talk about the way that, especially again in our community, that we almost re-traumatize ourselves and social media, as much as it is, has been great for things like social justice, it also allows us to traumatize ourselves over and over and over again, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there are things that I don't, you know, I have a teenage son that I don't allow him to watch. You know, there's, there's um, the movie about the Central Park Five, like I, I actually, as much as I applaud the fact that it was made, um, I definitely, you know, am, am a fan of the director. I didn't want him to see it yet. I taught him about the history of it. Mm -hmm. I taught him what happened, why it happened, explain the context so he's not ignorant, mm -hmm. right? So when, when we say, you know, maybe filter what you say to your children, we're not saying don't tell them that bad things happen, although sometimes that may also be an option, but it's more um, give them a chance to be children, right? Mm -hmm. And and some people will say, well, you know, if they're a black child, they don't, they don't, they don't get that luxury. They need to know that 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 things out there are gonna hurt them. But again, it's little by little, right? So mm -hmm. I didn't allow my son to watch it yet because he's at the the point of his life where he should be figuring out what he's gonna do. I didn't want him leaving that feeling like, well, no matter what I do, I could get, you know, I could get arrested um, for something I didn't even do, or I could get gunned down in the street. So in, in my house, we try not to watch the videos of the person getting slaughtered on the street or shot or the, getting roughed up by the police, because even if you, the first time you hear about it is stress, 
then you're watching it, right? And then same thing with the movie. I didn't want him to see these men, you know, emotional or people emotional because that's just more trauma. It's, mm -hmm. I don't know that we always have to do that to get the point, I guess is what I'm saying. Right, yeah. So um, that being said too, um, you know, isn't there also science, Dr. Clark, behind the effects of long-term trauma? For example, you know, I would imagine that the longer a person is exposed to trauma in their life, the worse, right, that the effects will be. So, you know, does it mean, all right, don't expose them till they're 10 versus five? Like, does any of that make a difference? Well, trauma affects people at different stages. And, um, you know, if we think about this, that wonderful brain that we were born with is, um, it's a beautiful organ, but it also, when it's injured, um, it can be resilient, but, you know, to your point, Dr. Atai, um, trauma can have short-term and long-term effects. So there is um, the part of the brain we call the, the, the prefrontal cortex or frontal lobe of our brain that um, basically helps us make decisions um, and helps us, you know, make logical decisions, right? So, for example, again, um, I think I alluded to earlier, we, um, you know, if you are, if you see a bear, um, you know, you kind of go into that fight or flight and you're, you're going to run, all right? So there's a, another part of our brain called the amygdala that is um, kind of our emotional processing part of the brain. We call that, it's part of the limbic system. And so the amygdala is a smart part of the brain, but over time, it can kind of um, overtake the frontal lobe, so to speak, because you can imagine if you're under a constant state of anxiety and stress, you're not going to be thinking rationally. And so your frontal lobe, uh, in, in some ways, can kind of shrink. And we, we have seen these, uh, this evidence in individuals with PTSD in certain areas of the brain. Um, there are lower volumes um, when we look at different parts of the brain and, and individuals mm. who've been traumatized. And so um, trauma is something that, again, it can not only affect us, uh, can affect us physically, but also, also mentally. And so um, things that um, you would normally not maybe perceive as a threat, the, that, that, that the, given that the brain is under a constant state of trauma, that amygdala is saying, don't trust this person, right? We talked about it's not all or none. There usually is some gray area. The, the common example I'll give is that, let's say you have a man or woman that has been sexually assaulted. Um, I'll, I'll use a man in this case. Um, and so let's say he was sexually assaulted by another man. Well, every time, you know, that amygdala says, every time you see a man, you should flee because men are dangerous. Mm -hmm. Men will hurt you. Right, but the frontal lobe would say, "Okay, well, you did have this experience where a man was mean to you um, and and did some horrific things, but that doesn't mean that all men you come in contact with will hurt you." And so there has to be a balance, right? There has to be a balance between the frontal lobe and the amygdala, just like it has to be a balance as what we were talking to earlier of how we talk to our kids about uh, about trauma. So. Um, if we look at long-term effects of trauma, if it's not dealt with, that that is problematic as well. Um, and, and then we wonder why, again, we talk about irritability and we, we wonder why people are hypervigilant um, and why people may turn to uh, what I'll refer to as maladaptive or an unhealthy coping skills like alcohol, um, like other substances. It's not because they want to get high, right? You know, we, we, we get this sense of like, oh, well, black people and brown people, they, they're always smoking weed or they're always, you know, and obviously the, the, that's, that's a delusion, that, that, that's a false, you know, that's a myth. Why, again, we have to ask the question, why? Why are people, whether it be black and brown people or um, other communities, why are they turning to alcohol? Well, usually people are trying to cope. They're trying to cope with trauma. And so trauma- Or escape. Or escape. Or escape, yes. Avoid, right? So how do you cope, right? So we talked about, okay, we all exercise, okay? But some people- Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, <laughs> sometimes, right? <laughs> Glass of wine is okay, remember, moderation. But, um, but, you know, sometimes people can resort to unhealthy coping mechanisms, and it's not because they're weak. 
it's after a while, I don't want to have to think about this. That numbing tech, you know, right? We, when we see this in post-traumatic stress disorder, also known as PTSD, individuals will become numb. And what better way to continue that numb feeling than to soak up, so to speak, everything that has happened with a bottle of, of, of liquor or, or a can of beer or other substances. So we have to intervene early and often. Um, you know, to Dr. Bell, it, it's always interesting. I, um, I'm a firm believer of, you know, they say um, if a, a, being a child psychiatrist makes you a, a, a good adult psychiatrist. Right. Um, I'm not going back to do a fellowship anytime soon, but um, that's why I have do friends. Do it. Like, it's still you. So, <laughs> but, um, but I believe that because, you know, Dr. Bell, you're seeing them at an early age. And, and, right. and then by the time, again, they, uh, they, they you know, transition into adulthood, if, those, if that trauma has not been processed, I see the, I'm seeing them almost when it's too late and, and, and it's never too late. I mean, I have hope that my patients will, will become resilient and, and, and get better. But you think about all the things that were missed back in their childhood that could have been addressed. And then they have this cognitive view of the world, which is skewed because again, well, this happened to me when I was six. So that means the world is an evil place and the world is not an evil place. They're just, you just happen to have experienced something traumatic that, you know, doesn't have to define you. So. Right. Not to, not to mention all those years that that child may have been suffering. And I don't mean suffering, you know, like you, they were hospitalized, but you know, it has to be tough to walk around with all that heaviness, right. That, that no one could help you with. So even though, yeah, they may have still, you know, graduated from school or gotten good grades and got into adulthood and work a job. But if just think about all that time that they could have been happier, right. Or, or it could have just been a kid instead of walking yeah. around with that. So, you know, that actually brings me to my next thought and my question, which is, you know, what if a mom or dad does identify that something is wrong? What should their first step be? What should they do? Right. Well, before I answer that, I wanted to share a quote really quickly that um, is about trauma in kids and says, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Okay, and they say that's by Frederick Douglass. And the truth is, we have got to build our children up strong when we can, right? Really, it's a blank slate. We get to teach them about life. They learn things from different people, but essentially you, you're, you're kind of molding what they are. So it's easier to address these traumas when they're younger than to wait, as Dr. Clark said, when you're older. And I just wanted to mention really quickly, there's an ACE study, Adverse Childhood um, Experiences um, or Events. And it's, it's proven that a lot of people who end up with substance use, uh, depression, anxiety, mental illness, any those things, or maybe people who don't even realize they're having difficulties, have had one or another of some traumatic event, didn't have food, parents were divorced. Um, it's things that you wouldn't even consider a trauma per se, because they happen, they happen to all your friends, you went on, you know, you just, you went on with it. Um, but it's just shown that our brains hold on to trauma. And there's a book, if you want to read one, it's called The Body Keeps Score. Um, excellent book, you can get it on audio book as well if you don't have time to to sit down with a book but back to your question um so the truth is if you notice that your child is struggling um and let's say it, it's happening right now just this is the first time they were doing fine before now you're noticing that they're they're having difficulties um i would sit down and talk to my child in a non-judgmental um age appropriate way you know, if they're really little, maybe they just want more time with you. And you've got to say, oh, well, you know, I know you miss your friends, but now you have more time with mommy. So let's play a game. Like, you know, meet them where they are. If it's a teenager, you might just sit in the room and watch a movie and neither of you are talking to each other. But but it's what they need. And so you, you do that. Um, but obviously, most people have a pediatrician or someone, you know, if it gets to the point where your child is just really out of character, they're you know, never wanting to wear a mask and you're telling them to wear a mask. They're going out doing risky behaviors, um, just acting in ways that you are truly concerned. Get your pediatrician, let them know, call them, see if they have any, you know, tools there. Um, I'm a child psychiatrist. It's sort of hard to find child psychiatrists, but, you know, if you can get an appointment and see your, your doctor, that's great. But I feel like you should always start with 
talking to them and, and just seeing what's going on. Because sometimes they just need a little more love and reassurance. They might need you to say, hey, look, I'm scared too sometimes, but I know blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, I know that there's hope or I know that things, bad things don't last always, you know, and then this is a time for the African American community, which we often do anyway, is to lean on your faith. If you have any faith, now's the time to, to really use it. You may not be able to go to church, but you can watch it online. Again, I always plug YouTube, YouTube, you can watch any sermon from whenever to now, anytime you need it. So if that helps, you know, if you want to read your Bible, whatever it is that helps you guys kind of get a sense of hope and not focus so much on everything that's wrong. Even with kids, they just want to feel like there's still some good, you know, and things can get better. And safe. And safe, right? It's hard to be without safety. Um, and to Dr. Clark's point, people who have been traumatized, you know, when he said hypervigilance, it's like they walk around and they're, they're looking everywhere, thinking someone's out to get them. Um, and, you know, I mean, yeah. Life is not good always in the African American community. There's racism. There is, there are dangers out there, but it doesn't mean that we're not ever safe. And and certainly, if you can't be safe outside, you should be safe at home. Um, which brings up another another point that during the pandemic, obviously a lot of things changed. People were at home more frequently, um, but unfortunately, we've seen an uptick in domestic violence towards women, towards men, mm -hmm. and you know, also towards children who are not able to go to school. They don't get meals anymore because um, they were getting free lunch or something at school. And so I just think we've got to look out for each other and just realize kids are under a lot of stress. Even if we feel like, oh, they're, they're young, they don't have anything to worry about. To them, they do. And, and it's real. Yeah. And also, you know, there's a lot of communities, at least in, in bigger cities, that actually have like mobile crisis for children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. where if you don't have an established psychiatrist or a therapist or your pediatrician can't get you in, sometimes, I mean, there's months before you can get an appointment. Right. You can call like emergency lines and someone will come to your house or a social worker, or they'll actually show up in a van and, and come in and talk to you and in your child. So definitely, you know, check into whatever is in your neighborhood at the time. And right. so, you know, Dr. Clark, the other thing that I think sometimes we don't think about is, you know, kids are, are modeling after their parents, right? So right now, when, when some topics are, are too hard for even an adult to talk about, um, you know, especially if a family member passed away or, or if they're not handling the, the pandemic well, um, what, what tips do you have for that parent that might be suffering from their own anxiety or their own depression, and now they see something in their children. What if they can't even help themselves? What, what do they say to that kid? It's a very good question, Dr. Ty. I, you know, in order for us to, I say this to my patients all the time, especially those who are parents, in order to be the best mother or father or grandmother or grandfather that you wanna be um, to, your, to your children or grandchildren, you have to take care of yourself. And um, kids are, um, our kids are always watching. Again, you know, I talked about kids are curious. Kids are, kids are smart. They know when mom or dad or grandma, grandpa, uncle, cousins, aunt, you know, aunties are not doing well. Um, and they can sense it, right? And so it's almost kind of like they have that sixth sense of, you know, and, and, and then they ask, mom, dad, you, are you doing okay? And what do we usually respond by saying, oh, we're, we're, we're fine, everything's good. Pretend. We're not, right, right, we're, we're really not fine. And so um, if parents are, are struggling, um, very important to identify that early and often and, and seek help um, because if, if, ki if the kids are seeing that and they recognize it, they're going to kind of in some ways feed off of that right i mean you know we because i think kids i think kids view their parents as kind of they you know i think we kind of did this part when we were growing up we we idealize our parents uh, in a lot of ways right we we think they're kind of like the superheroes um of, of the house and and so nothing can touch them they're you know they're and and so we know as as parents now that that's obviously not true that 
you know, uh, our parents went through <laughs> thick and thin to, um, to get us where we are. But um, I think it's important for parents to acknowledge how they're feeling. Again, it's okay to be vulnerable. We talked about that um, um, in, in a previous episode of be able to just say, I need help. Mm-hmm. Wave that flag and say, I'm not doing well. And um, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of um, family therapy. Dr. Bell, you can speak to this as a child and adolescent psychiatrist oh, yes. more than I can, but we know what the research shows that family therapy can be beneficial mm-hmm. um, because if the parent is hurting, the child is probably hurting as well. And so what better way to fellowship with one another and to be a, a united, come to, as a united front, that family unit is so, it's so important, right? How many times do we hear kids say, well, my mom is struggling, my dad is struggling, but I don't feel like I can talk to them because even though they're struggling, they're going to tell me everything's going to be okay, right? I, it's okay to kind of normalize things, but it's one thing to normalize things. There's another thing to just be like, okay, we need, to, we need to address this, right? And so um, I think family therapy can be important. I think the, the parent doing their own individual therapy can be important. Um, and so when, when this is happening, I think that more often than not, um, the, the parents need, we need to, as parents, identify how we're feeling. Um, if it's getting to the point, especially, you know, one thing we haven't mentioned um, in this segment yet is, is suicide. Okay, um, you know, the studies have, have come out recently now where uh, especially um, black children ages 5 to 12 are two times at higher risk of um, having a suicide attempt Wow. compared to our white brothers and sisters. And what's interesting, greater than age 12, um, you don't see that as much. It's actually um, uh, more um, hom- homicide um, and, hmm. and try to account for that but that that's a that's an age age range that we need to be mindful of um and children especially black children our, our own children five to twelve years old right. two times the rate so right. there's there's a disparity there uh, when it comes to to suicide in the black community it used to be when we were growing up it was almost kind of like a protective factor right you didn't hear right. about black people you know our people committing suicide or attempting suicide the, the 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 data is now showing that there's a there's a shift um, and and, and the pendulum has kind of swung the other way and and we have to be mindful of that some of that is due to bullying um, we can argue that some of that is due to institutionalized uh, racism discrimination whatever you want to term it or, or call it these are things that are affecting our community and if parents are not taking care of themselves we can kind of guarantee that the children are not going to, well, not guarantee, but we, one could, you know, um, guess that children are going to be hurting and may resort to, again, unhealthy coping skills because they don't feel like they can reach out to their parents. Because if the parents say, I'm fine, then what's the, ch- the child going to say? Well, if mom and dad are fine, I'm fine too. Right. right. And then they start to normalize it, which is, which is something I think we all have to keep in mind. Our children think that what we're doing is normal, right? Sometimes what we're doing is normal. It's normal for us. It's what we do. But sometimes what we do is not the best thing to do in that situation. And so um, if they're going to normalize something, we want it to be the healthiest thing that they can do. Um, and I wanted to give... Um, Two, two important numbers. The suicide hotline, very easy, 1-800-SUICIDE. So there are actual numbers that correspond. I don't remember those, but um, it's 1-800-SUICIDE. For teenagers or people who can text, the text line is 741-741. Anytime you're on your phone, if you have an emergency, you can text that number. They will get in touch with you. Um, but, I, but I do think that often we miss the suicide risk. And then Dr. Clark, I'm very glad you brought that up because we miss the risk, not, not necessarily physicians, but as parents, as African-Americans in the community, because people either assume that children, oh, you know, they're stressed, they have nothing to worry about, they're fine, or you don't have bills, you know, why are you worried? All you have to do is go to school. But stress is building on our children and it's building quicker than before. And they don't have an outlet and there's social media, there's bullying, there's you know bullying that we didn't experience because we didn't have people texting about us or in group chat, whatever. Um, so they just have other issues. And then unfortunately in the African-American community, as we mentioned in a previous episode, there's still this huge stigma. 
people might see the, their children suffering, but they may take it as a personal um, affront. Like, oh, well, I didn't fail as a parent. I mean, you, you're sad, but I don't want to tell somebody about it because it might reflect on me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really important that we realize that mental health is important. It's, I, I, we all have mental health. We have physical health, we have mental health, we have spiritual health. All three are important and they should be held in some sort of balance. Um, but we can't ignore our children's suffering, even unintentionally. We have to just pay attention to it um, and seek help when we need to. Um, because they, they are hurting and it's kind of sliding through because people are like, oh, black people don't commit suicide. Well, they do, right. we do. Right. Um, and it's important that we, we keep that in mind and children do. Right. Also and lock I, up your guns if you have guns. I just want to put that in there. They can, they can crack the code, put the bullets separately. Um, don't have a code, don't have a lock and you put the key on top. Kids are always watching. And if they truly are hurting or thinking of ending their life, they will be very um, creative in ways to do it. So we see that a lot on the inpatient unit and it's, it's obviously very sad. Yeah. You know, Dr. Clark bringing up the statistic is, it makes me wonder kind of what we were talking about at the beginning that I wonder if that age group is just having a hard time processing the same thing that a teenager maybe can, you know, maybe they're going to act out in a different way. But right. when you're five through 12, you just, you don't know how to deal. Right. And so that's the first thing that came into my mind. And then the other thing that I thought about when I was listening to both of you guys is just, I think parents being honest. And so again, I am kind of contradicting myself from earlier where I said, don't tell the kids too much, right? But now I, I but I also think that I, there's a, there's something to disclosing your own vulnerability, right? I, I have always, even with my own son, of course I filter aid appropriately, but when I've had arguments with friends, um, I've told him about it, you know, auntie, auntie, so-and-so, uncle, so-and-so, oh, why don't they come visit us anymore? Well, you know, we had a little disagreement and then he can see how we worked through it. Exactly. Right. Then now they're back at the cookout <laughs> and they say, oh, they're back. Yes. Yes. Cause we, we sat down up. and we apologized and we <laughs> hugged. Right. I think, and it sounds silly, but I think that, like you said, they're watching us. So right. when they get into an argument with a friend or if someone treats them wrong, they'll know, oh no, I don't put up with that. I, you know, we're not going to be friends anymore. Right. Um, likewise, I think similarly within, you know, uh, when you have two parents in the household or, or the child is, is watching relationships, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. I know there's some parents that never want the kid to see them argue, never want the kids to see them have a disagreement. Now I'm not saying you should be shouting at your spouse or your, your, your um, partner in front of the children because that is also traumatic. But okay. I think there's something to be said for them seeing how you work through problems, how right. you guys can disagree on a topic and respect each other and not yell and not get in each other's faces mm -hmm. and show them a healthy way to deal with that because if they're seeing it in a uh, somewhere else that's unhealthy or they walk around their whole life and think my parents never fought. So then they became, they become an adult. They get a girlfriend or a boyfriend and they get into one fight. They think the world is over, right? right. Because they're like, Nope, couples don't argue, but they did. They just did in their bedroom. Right. So I think we have to find the, 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 the middle ground, I think of sharing, but not too much because in the sharing and them watching us, they're going to learn how to do these things, right? When, when, right. when they get older. So and, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, yes, um, you're, you're making really good points. And we actually teach that from child psychiatry as well, child and teen psychiatry. Um, because, so the point is not to overexpose, but to model. We all get angry. It is very dishonest to try to tell your children that you don't get angry, you don't get mad, I'm never sad, I don't cry. Um, but you know, your child also shouldn't come in and you're crying every single day. Right. If that's happening, then that's the time where you have to say, as much as I wanna keep it real and be honest, then I have to be real and say, I'm having something going on and I need to get some, get some help with this. But it's okay to say, you know, mommy is, is having a bad day. I'm kind of in a bad, I'm feeling grouchy. You know, if it's a little kid, I'm feeling grouchy. I think I should go to timeout. And that's when you go <laughs> over and go to the spa or not the spa, but maybe have a nice bath, have a candle, you know, whatever it is, but it's okay to show them, as you said, 
modeling of when I am angry, even if I wanted to yell, I'm not going to yell. I'm going to go to my room and take a time out, you know, whatever, take some time for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you don't show them, what, who, where are they going to see it? On TV, social media, um, somewhere doing something that you may or may not approve of. Um, and that's important with their mental health. That's important with learning healthy ways to cope, with dealing with, you know, the stress of not knowing if you're going to be exposed to a virus when you go outside. I mean, you know, we just have to show our children we are human. And to Dr. Clark's point, if we don't take good, health, good care of ourselves, then we truly have nothing to give to our children in terms of coping skills. If you get mad and all you do is drink, then your children are going to see you get mad and drink, right? And if that's happening, then you can say, you know, oh, I wasn't dealing with my stress or, you know, I wasn't doing that right. I'm going to go find a new way to, to handle when I get mad. There's nothing wrong with saying that. They've already seen you do it. Um, that's probably more honest than pretending that you don't do that and they see the caps, you know, or whatever all over the house. Um, so I think that it is a balance. We have to be honest, but you don't want to steal. The, these are the magic years, okay? These are the time where you can pretend and, you know, uh, use your imagination and you can dream of what you want your life to be. And yes, we are resilient as African Americans. And yes, you know, we all make it one way or another, but we can have hope that our children don't have to go through the struggles we went through. You know, they don't have to make it to the nail just because you did, you know? So I think it's okay to, to imagine a new way to do things, even if it's different from what happened with our parents or That's with true. us. That's true. Dr. Clark, you know, the other thing that I, that I definitely noticed with children, actually it happens with adults too, but definitely with children that in times of stress, like right now, it's not just, what we're seeing is not just their response to stress. It's also unroofing maybe conditions that they already had that had not been diagnosed before or were diagnosed, but not treated, right? But again, in our community, we have this thing about taking medications that affect your brain. And even the people that are willing to take an antidepressant as an adult don't want to medicate their children, right? They, it's a bad thing in their mind. Right. What, do you, what do you think about that? Well, I think that we are doing our communities a disservice when we are withholding what I would classify as life-saving treatment. Uh, now, I'll be the first to, to tell you, and, and I think Dr. Bell would share in my, um, uh, my sentiments on this, that medications aren't the end-all be-all, okay? And I, I will say this because I think oftentimes there's even a stigma with psychiatrists, right? You know, uh, well, you guys are just the pill pushers, okay? Um, you know, I alluded to in our previous episode I do my own therapy. I'm a huge proponent of therapy. We all are on this on this on this um, um, recording right now, and talking about how how important therapy is. But here's the thing: while therapy can be beneficial, sometimes um, I like to when I talk to my patients about treatment, I talk about it as pieces to the puzzle. So there are multiple pieces to a puzzle in terms of your recovery. And when I say recovery, I'm talking not the substance use, I'm talking about their recovery as a person, um, whether that be depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, et cetera. The pieces to the puzzle are different for every individual, right? It's kind of tailor-made treatment. So for some people, pieces of the puzzle could be just medication. For other people, it could be medication and therapy. For some, it might just be therapy. But I think it's important to give people those options of, hey, not everybody who's depressed needs to be on an antidepressant, okay? So, but I think, again, to what you alluded to, Dr. Uh, Ty, was, again, the stigma, right? Medications like Zoloft, Prozac, Celexa, these are all c- commonly used anti- um, to treat uh, depression and anxiety. It's, it's almost like... Um, People get this kind of little sensation in their gut when you when you mention these 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 um, these medicines, and it's like, why is that? And some of it is based on our history. Okay, if we think about, um, you know, we don't want to be used as it, you know, be experimented with, right? Or or be the experiment. Uh, we don't want to be the lab rat or whatever the guinea pig. You know, these are all terms that we hear. And if we go back to the Tuskegee experiment. 
we all know how that panned out and that did not pan out um, well for, for, um, the, for the black community. So some of it I think is, has a historical perspective. There's a distrust uh, within the, um, the healthcare system. And then when you um, delve that, if you uncover the other layers, God forbid you talk about somebody being depressed, right? Um, um, I have family members that, um, you know, are like, I, again, I'm too blessed to be stressed, right? You know, it, it's like, you know, and, and, and I'm a man of faith and I pray. And again, I, I went through my own depression. Does that mean that I'm, um, that I didn't pray enough to, 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 to the Lord? Because, you know, we don't say that, we don't say that when somebody gets cancer, right? If grandma right now was like, baby, I just got diagnosed with cancer. We don't say, oh my God, like if you just would have prayed enough, you, you know, things would be okay. We're saying, let us, let us help you. Like, let's talk about chemo. Let's talk to the doctors. What can we do? But we don't do that with our children. And we don't do that um, with, 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 with parents, right? We, it's almost like, I think parents feel like um, it's a moral failure, right? If their children have to take a medicine, it's no different from diabetes. Um, I, the, I, what often I tell my patients, do you know if you have diabetes that increases your risk for developing depression? And if you have that depression, that increases your risk for developing diabetes. And they'll, people will look at me and say, I didn't know that, mm -hmm. you know? So again, it's this mind body connection. I, I, if I could tell any parent out there listening right now and, and, and if any children, if their children are listening, in order to be your best self, that requires things that maybe we didn't think we would need, okay? Um, and again, going back to my own story, I took antidepressants for uh, while I was in medical school. I was very depressed. Now, I don't take antidepressants anymore, but again, I alluded to, I still do my own therapy. Um, do my own therapy. Did I think that I would ever become depressed? No. Did I think it, I would ever have to take a medicine for depression? No, but you do things we, we all have to do things that sometimes make us uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And for the greater good. It, for the greater good, absolutely, Dr. Bell. And if that's going to extend my life, I'm okay with that. Right. I'm okay with that. I'd rather, I rather take a medication that I know has been proven to be beneficial than to, again, resort to unhealthy coping mechanisms that I know is going to, in, in, in two ways, either I'm going to end up dead or I'm going to end up in the prison system. And right. that is usually, unfortunately, what happens to our youth. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about the meds thing, too, is that, you know, I always try to explain to folks that, you know, the brain is just a bunch of chemicals and electricity, right? right. So sometimes you need a little bit of help to balance out the chemicals. That's how I try to explain it, particularly mm -hmm. around trauma. Trauma meaning not you got punched in the face trauma, although sometimes that can affect the brain too. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm talking more, you know, let's say a parent passes away or a grandparent passes away or a friend, another child passes away, right? Mm -hmm. How does that person deal with it? I don't think people realize that those things literally change the chemistry and sometimes the structure of, yes. of their own brain, right? So again, if you just stay the same as you were when you came out the womb, great. But we're living life and life and trauma and sad things and bad things are literally changing our brains. Mm -hmm. So I try to get them to think of the medicine kind of even returning them back to the way that they are supposed to be after all of this trauma and especially with children i feel like people feel like well i don't want to put that label on them or i don't want to give them meds for the rest of their life now there are some people just like people with high blood pressure and diabetes that will have to take medicines for the rest mm -hmm. of their life but there's also people that just need it through that grief that right. just needed to balance things out or once they go through puberty they grow out of whatever was going on again because hormones are just chemicals. Right. So I just think that, again, it's just the, the stigma. Sometimes it's frustrating as a provider or as a physician mm -hmm. trying to just get people to, to see it a little bit differently. And I agree with you guys. I'm not super pro-medicine. I don't believe that, that all roads lead to the bottom of a bottle. Um, but again, if you're seeing something unhealthy, and I love what you said, you want to be your best self 
right? right. And if there's something that can help, then then do it. Um, so yeah. I just sorry, wanted to, I wanted to say quickly because um, this is literally the battle I go through daily, right, at work. I see children, I see adolescents, they come in, they're having some difficulty where either their schools have come to attention or the parent is worried or the child says, I need help. And then we get to the discussion on medicine and you, you all hit the nail on the head and that parents are like, oh, well, no, I don't, I don't want to use medicine. I mean, most don't want therapy, but they may be willing, but they certainly don't want medicine. And all I can say is we, we all want to give our children the best chance to do well right? We don't want them to have a label, but trust me, if your child is acting out, if they are sad and depressed, if they are not doing their schoolwork because they can't focus, they have ADHD, they already have a label Correct. from someone. So at this point, we have to do what we can to get them better. And I'm not, um, I won't say I am, you know, pro-medicine, like every single thing needs a medication, but I'm certainly not anti-medication. And I think that it helps it changes their brain. It sets their brain up to let the chemicals go where they need to go, to focus when they need to focus, to heal and to not be depressed. And um, I think we would be better off not trying to um, fight that stigma and, and not wanting to get a label and letting our children flourish under the best conditions. Because people do better when they feel well. And sometimes you need medicine, sometimes you don't. You're right. Sometimes you're on it for a long time, sometimes you're on it for a short time, but if I had to take a pill every day for my blood pressure, guess what? I would take it. If I had to take a pill every day for my depression, I would take it. I mean, that that's just because being fruitful and being productive is more important. And even with children, there there have been so many studies on these medications. They are safe. You know, they're there are side effects to everything, but when you're weighing the the risk and benefits of your child killing themselves because they have gotten so depressed and really feeling down, which sounds extreme, but unfortunately, it's real. Or failing I work on the inpatient. Mm -hmm. Or failing out of school. Or failing out of school, either of those. And they both may be depression or just being so, you know, irritable that you can't stand to be around your baby that you love because they're arguing every day. All of that is real, you know, real things that happen. But on the inpatient unit, we have kids every day, every day, every day that have tried to in their life, you know, and then you get to the bottom of it, you see them one time, they're like, okay, I'll take the medicine. You know, a month later, they're back again. What happened? Oh, well, you know, I didn't want to take it. A month later, they're back, you know, so we have to do what we can to break the cycle. I know it's scary, but find a doctor you can trust, someone you believe in, and stay the course, you know, and, and just hope for the best and, and give it a chance because medications do help, along with therapy and other eating well, exercising, you know, training your brain to think a certain way. Those things work. Here's my last question. If I'm a kid, because, you know, kids are watching YouTube also. Hopefully <laughs> they can the video, right? Hello. Kids, whether they're seven watching this, um, I don't know that they would have gotten through all of this, this talk, but, um, or if they're a teenager that are watching this and maybe they don't have strong um parents or not strong i mean like a strong relationship i should say mm -hmm. with their parents such that they can go to them about this and say look I, you know i listen i looked at this video and every i have everything on you know that they described what can they do as children to get help if maybe their parents don't notice or or the parent is so so, you know, sad and depressed themselves over whatever they just, whatever loss they just had. Right. What does the kid do? Is there anything they can do on their own? Um, so children have a lot of advocates, whether they know it or not. You know, as physicians, we're all mandated reporters. If we see something concerning, we have to, to do something about it. But, um, you know, a child, so here's the truth. It might be a little harder now because people are home. You know, when you were going to school every day, you could tell your teacher, you know, I'm, I'm really having problems with blah, 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 or they may notice that you are, you know, not finishing your homework on time or, or something. But, you know, maybe you have an aunt, maybe you have a grandma, maybe you have a, a family friend. Um, if there's anybody you feel that you can trust, I would just say, you know, hey, you know, I'm feeling sad, or can I talk to you? There, there are always people who are wanting to know. And then you can always write one of those hotlines that I told them about, the 741-741, because that's not only something to do if you feel suicidal. Some of these things are coping skills, stress, 
Um, how can I stop crying every day after school? Or how can I not be so angry? You know, so there are people you can reach out to. You have to be more creative now, though, unfortunately. Do they, do they address bullying on that hotline, too? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. Bullying, for sure. Dr. Clark, any thoughts about what they can do for themselves? You know, I, um, to piggyback off of uh, what Dr. Bell said, I, being creative and, and unfortunately with, with the COVID pandemic, um, we are kind of isolated and kids are definitely more isolated. So uh, I'm a huge fan of hotlines. I would also put a plug in for Mental Health of America uh, and then the National Alliance of Mental Illness, also known as NAMI. Um, those are wonderful resources for not only children, but also um, parents. Um, to learn more about, okay, you know, what, what is, what is, when people say mental illness, what does that exactly mean? You know, if somebody says depression, oftentimes, you know, when people say depression, well, I don't know what that means. I mean, we all on the, on uh, all three of us know what it means, but I think, you know, when we're talking about education and advocacy, um, not only for the, the, the children, but also for the, for the parents, these are two organizations that I feel do a, um, a great job of, education and advocacy and making sure that communities um, that, that, that we're addressing um, the community's needs. And so um, hotlines, um, you can even text, there's even texting hot, uh, hotlines and especially in this day and age, everybody wants to text, you know, you, we all grew up where you actually pick up the phone and call people. So. And <laughs> but, that phone um, was attached to the wall. Right. <laughs> the long that. cord that got twisted because yeah. you're, you know, having it around. That's right, and then you could be on the internet as well while you were while you were on the phone. Okay, so. yeah, you had to choose. Oh, well. Correct. Right. Right. <laughs> no, um, I will definitely put those resources um, down yeah. below below this video. Um, so that are there are any kids or parents that that need some some help or just want to learn more. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, you know, thank you guys so much for coming on and talking about this. Thank you. I think it's an important topic. We could probably go on for another 20 minutes or so <laughs> or longer. Um, but thank you guys for also watching. Um, again, I'm going to put resources below. If you like this content, please subscribe and like this video and you'll get notified for the next episode. Thank you and have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Stay well, guys. Bye-bye.